welcome back friends. Now that you have looked at uh, uh, designing pedestrian facilities at uh, your urban streets, uh, let us now focus on the other type of non-motorized transport which is uh, designing for cycling or bicycling infrastructure. So, in this lecture we will be looking at the different principles just as we had several principles of NMT infrastructure that we had looked at. Now, we will specifically look at principles for uh, designing bicycle infrastructure and also look at some of the cross sectional design elements. These are all based on IRC 11 which was uh, released in 2015. So, in designing for uh, bicycle facilities we have to again keep in mind that we are not only dealing with bicycles, we are also dealing with rickshaws, cycle rickshaws, cycle carts, hand pulled, ca hand -pulled carts etcetera. So, there are different types of vehicles or non-motorized uh, um, uh, bicycles that we are dealing with. Not only the ones uh, that are adult touring, but they may be uh, uh, luggage attached to it, uh, that kind of a uh, 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 bicycle, there may be a cycle rickshaw that we are talking about, maybe cycle carts and hand pulled carts. So, all of this combined uh, together uh, forms the uh, design principles for uh, cyclists, uh, cyclists. And then it is also the design is also based on which type of road we are designing it for. The hierarchy of the roads in the transportation network matters in this case, whether it is an arterial, sub arterial, whether it is a local street. So, it matters on which street we are uh, designing the bicycle network. The five basic principles to keep in mind while designing for uh, uh, cycle infrastructure is coherence, directness, safety and security, attractiveness and comfort. Right? Many of this are very similar to uh, what we had looked at it uh, when we were trying to design or when we were designing uh, pedestrian infrastructure where they had to be safe, secure, they had to attract, they had to be attractive or they had to uh, 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 attract the people choice users. Uh, to using this facility, they have to be comfortable, it has to be direct, uh, should avoid detours and so on and so forth. Right? And the other thing that uh, IRC recommends is that we design facilities so that a speed of at least of anywhere between 5 to 15 kilometer per hour can be maintained on such facilities. Right? If it is too low, then it, uh, this bicyclist will be uh, discouraged from using such facilities and if it is too high then there might be some safety repercussions for bicyclists. We will, uh, you have already uh, maybe looked at uh, such bicycle lanes uh, which are also now available in few cities in India. Uh, bicycle boxes uh, are something that are coming up which allows you to, uh, uh, which allow the bicycles to come up uh, to the front and right next to the, uh, in the front of the intersection uh, so that when the signal turns green the bicyclists are the first people who can leave the intersection uh, safely and you must have also encountered some public bicycle sharing systems in your cities uh, which may be which allow you to not own a bicycle but still use the bicycle by renting them at an hourly basis and the rents are usually very cheap. So, as per the uh, IRC guidelines. Uh, there are some standard dimensions for different types of uh, bicycles. Uh, IRC defines four different types of bicycles. Uh, first one is an adult touring bicycle, second one is an adult touring bicycle with goods, next one is an a rickshaw and next one is a, the last one is a goods rickshaw. So, it defines four different classes of bicycles and for each, uh, uh, each class of bicycle it has some standard clearances and widths. So, if you just look at one of them, uh, you would say that the first one uh, capital W is the width of the cycle itself. So, when we, are, when we look at the width of the cycle for different classes of cycle, it ranges from anywhere between 750 meters, uh, 750 millimeters to about uh, 1.4 meters. So, that is the range of the width of a cycle. The next one small a is the clearance from obstacles uh, which are yeah, very close to the bicycle. 
uh, anywhere between 0 to 50 millimeters away. So, this is A, right. So, you have to have some, you have to have no obstacles uh, where your pedal, essentially where your pedaling zone is, right. If your pedaling zone, if you have any obstacles, then you will not be able to pedal very smoothly. So, that is uh, what A tells, uh, what A represents. B is the clearance zone from obstacles anywhere beyond 50 mm, but less than 150 mm. So, that is B, okay. So, anywhere between uh, beyond 50 mm, but less than 50, uh, 150 mm. C is clearance from fixed obstacles like poles and bollards. So, you have to have your poles and bollards at least a few millimeters away from the bicycles. So, again like you remember, bicyclists usually prefer to ride on the edge of the roads. So, as you ride closer and closer to the edge of the road, many of the street furniture also comes very close to you. But a safe design is to have a basic clearance from your street furniture or fixed obstacles like poles and bollards and D is the final uh, clearance is D which is clearance from any kind of closed walls, right. So, all these values of A, B, C and D and for different types of uh, cycles are shown in this chart. These are again based on IRC 11 2015. The next element uh, in designing for uh, bicycle infrastructure or cycling infrastructure along urban streets is to look at the turning radius of the bicycle track or the shared use path or whichever you are trying to design. Bends, they should be smooth connections between cycling paths and ensure continuity, right. These bends that you are often trying to design, they depend upon the turning radius. You would be coming at a certain speed and would be wanting to continue at the same speed, but bends always restrict the speed by a certain amount. So, by how much amount should they be restricting, uh, so on and so forth depends upon the turning radius that you provide. Sharper the bend, the lower will be the speed, the more sharp you provide. But it is recommended that the minimum design speed of 12 kilometers per hour be maintained at all bends, right. If a cyclist traveling at 12 kilometers per hour comes at a bend, he or she should be able to negotiate the bend at that speed. So, it is preferred that a turning radius of 30 meter or more is provided, which also ensures that visual directness and continuity of the path is maintained. So, this person should be a, after negotiating the bend should be able to visually see and also the path would be continuous. Radius of less than 10 meters should not be considered as it does not permit cycling at a comfortable cruising speed, right. So, these are some principles you have to keep in mind while you are designing for turning radius of a bicycle. So, if you look at the turning radius and its basic uh, physics principles, what happens is the weight of the bicycle plus rider is coming downwards. There is some sort of a friction with the road. So, that friction is given by a coefficient of friction times uh, w which, which is nothing but mg. So, f s times mg is the friction. So, the radius at the turn if you provide r and if the bicycle speed is v. So, the reaction to the ground has two components. This r has two components cos r cos theta and r sin theta. r cos theta counterbalances the weight, right. r cos theta counterbalances the weight, whereas r sin theta and the friction acts as the centripetal force for which the bicycle turns. So, r sin theta is nothing but m squared uh, uh, mv squared by r plus your friction which we already know as f s time mg. So, if you divide 2 by 1 tan theta is equal to you would get. So, if you divide equation 2 by equation 1 you will get tan theta is equal to v squared by r g plus f s or if you solve for v you will realize that the maximum speed at a bend 
that a cyclist can maintain depends upon the radius that is provided at that uh, at that bend right uh, and there should be sufficient friction that uh, allows the bicyclist to negotiate that bend and ensures that he or she does not skid at that bend so a maximum is the maximum speed at which the bicycle can turn without skidding so v max is the maximum speed and that is given by the square root of r times g times tan theta minus fs so irc 11 suggests that the fs value should be 0.3 coefficient of friction of 0.3 theta should not be more than 18 degrees so people should not uh, be bending for more than 18 degrees and a widening of about 0.51 meter per lane is required to accommodate the extra width on account of this bending. So, at the bend the uh, cycle track is widened by at least 0.51 meters in order to accommodate for that sp speed. Okay. Uh, in case of bicycle lanes usually super elevation is not necessary just uh, uh, as opposed to when you are providing for a uh, turning radii for motorized vehicles super elevation may be required but in this cases super elevation is not required so if you look at a quick uh, uh, problem uh, then you would understand how to determine the maximum speed uh, so if you are asked to determine the maximum speed which is required for a bicycle to make a safe turn without skidding for a turn rating turning radius of 30 meters utilizing all the information given in IRC 11. So, all the information meaning all these values, right. So, if you use all this, also you have to comment if this speed is good for operation and discuss a way for its improvement. So, let us see what is the result <coughs> of this uh, maximum speed based on uh, 30 meter uh, turning radius. So, you know already the formula for it. Uh, uh, if 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 uh, IRC suggests a FS value of 0 0.3 and and a theta of uh, 18 degrees, and you have uh, uh, you already know that the turning radius is uh, 30 meters. A turning radius is 30 meters, um, and G is 9.8. Uh, this should be uh, 30 meters. Uh, and g is 9.81. So, if you are putting these values, you will get a maximum speed of 21.17 meter per second. So, in your in your uh, comments and discussion section, what you can write is cruising speed of a bicycle uh, is usually anywhere between 18 to 20 kilometers per hour. Remember, when we were if you go back a few slides, we had uh, told we had told you that uh, at least uh, at least anywhere between 5 to 15 uh, speed is required and also a minimum design speed at bends should be at least 12 kilometers per hour. So, here what we are seeing is that for negotiating anywhere between 15 to 20 kilometers per hour uh, and maintaining this speed of 15 kilometers the radius that should be provided if you use the same formula and find out the radius. Uh, for maintaining a 15, uh, uh, a 15 kilometer per hour speed, you will see that such a high radius usually is required 922 meters of radius. Such large turning radius may not be available at urban roads. So, usually such large turning radius is not available, hence the speed at the uh, bends should be lowered a little bit while you are uh, approaching a bend. So, that is the a discussion that you have to have right now the next thing in design element to remember is when you encounter any inclines or slopes so it is very uh, as it involves a lot of physical activity in bicycling usually bicyclists do not uh, like to have very steep inclines or slopes so they should be uh, the most desirable consideration is to avoid uh, any level changes but if level changes have to be made, 
there are some standards that are provided by IRC. If the level to be negotiated is uh, uh, only about 1 meter, then the recommended slope is anywhere between 1 is to 12 and 1 is to 20. Whereas, if a railway overbridge, for example, has to be negotiated, then the slopes become anywhere between 1 is to 40 to 1 is to 60. Uh, negotiating a bridge on a tunnel may be unavoidable for a cyclist, so that becomes uh, a, a problem. But uh, uh, if the slopes are, uh, if the recommended slopes are implemented, it helps the bicyclist negotiate, negotiate those, uh, negotiate such a uh, rough or a steep incline. Very important to make the ground level more uh, cycle, uh, more cycle friendly than expecting cyclists to detour from there natural path. So, as much as possible we have to keep a level floor or a le uh, the level has to be kept as low as uh, as level as possible otherwise the cyclist will have to take a detour which means a longer distance and if the distance keeps on increasing between the origin and destination then bicyclist would not want to use the mode of transportation or the this NMT mode of transportation. and go back to using their motorized vehicles. So, we want to avoid any such situation. And also on a decline, junctions and obstructions should be spaced reasonably far from the bottom of the incline because cyclists need plenty of free space at the bottom of the incline to recover the speed. So, usually what you will see is that uh, when you are coming down, people usually do not recommend a speed hump right at the bottom of the uh, incline, but a speed hump uh, usually a little bit later on, so that there is some recovery time given to the bicyclists. And also next thing to remember for the cross sectional elements is because we had told you earlier that the design depends upon the type of road, you have to keep in mind for which type of road you are developing your design for the bicycle facility. It depends upon the hierarchy of the road. So, if you look at four different hierarchies, arterial, subarterial, collector and access roads, you will see that usually the right of ways of such roads are, uh, are uh, um, given here 50 to 80 meters for arterials, whereas for access roads uh, the right of way is very uh, less, anywhere between 6 to 15 meters and the design speed of vehicles is given here. So, when you know the design speed of vehicular traffic, it becomes very, very essential to design your bicycle tracks according to such design speeds. Otherwise, they may become too unsafe for the cyclists to use their cycle on any one type of uh, roadways. If you look at uh, the cross sections of each of these, you would see that uh, in uh, in any type of arterial or sub arterial road, uh, you can have, you may have a service road, right? You may have a service road or a service lane, which may be may or may not be used for parking. Then you may have your brown area, which may be a footpath, right? Then you have your orange cycle tracks. You may have a cycle track after the footpath, and then you may have a tree belt which separates the cycle tracks from the actual carriageway, right. So, you, you may have this type of a design, whereas there these the alternate designs are uh, very close to each other. Uh, in this type of design, you may have another, you may have the tree belt, uh, uh, the tree belt or the swell on the left hand side uh, rather than on the right hand side and you may only have a very small um, uh, vegetation that separates uh, the bicycles with the uh, vehicles on the main carriageway. Uh, on the other hand, you may have a tree line uh, uh, on the extreme left hand side, even the left of the uh, uh, service lane and you may have your uh, sidewalks, cycle lanes and a little bit of vegetation uh, between the uh, carriageway and the bicyclist. So, different cross sections uh, of roads shown for uh, either arterial or sub arterial uh, type of uh, categories of roads for which you can develop your um, or design for your cycle tracks right 
more or less you see that the cycle track and the uh, footpath and the footpath are always most likely to be next to each other apart from uh, in the last uh, section where you see that there is no when there is uh, when there is no uh, service lane at that point everything is at the left hand side of the road the other prototype is a collector or a distributor street in a collector cross section you can see that usually you do not have any uh, service lanes usually you can at that point in time put your uh, design your cycle tracks on the carriageway itself because right next to the carriageway itself because what happens is the speeds along collectors or distributor streets the average speed of vehicles is low so the cyclists feel feel safer to ride along with the motorized vehicles when compared to uh, arterials or subarterials where the average speed of the traffic is very high so they need always a separation from the traffic right so that is the basic difference between when you are designing a cycle track for a collector or a distributor street versus when you are designing it for a arterial or a subarterial street again you can go through each one of the different prototypes in this case <coughs> sorry finally when you are looking at a local street or an access street uh, it is uh, very similar to uh, the situation that you encounter uh, uh, in the previous collector or distributor street where the uh, average speed of vehicles on the right of on the um, carriageway is pretty low so you may not even have a different cycle lane right so you see there is no different yellow marking cycle lanes the cycles cyclists and the motorists can coexist on the same uh, carriageway because the speeds are pretty low so you can have a uh, you can have then the uh, 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 vegetation path between the cyclist and the pedestrians or you can have the pedestrians right next to the bicyclists or you can sometimes which is a uh, case in our uh, indian cities many of our indian uh, um, access uh, access streets or local streets whereas there is no uh, sidewalk for the pedestrians as well as they are walking on the same uh, carriageway as the bicyclists and the motorists this is okay when it is the uh, it is an access road or access street or a local street because the average speed of vehicles is low similar type of uh, prototypes are shown for more access and local streets finally when you start uh, looking at uh, some of the dimensions and some of the measurements for different types of bicycle infrastructure so the different types of bicycle infrastructure include segregated cycle tracks cycle lanes or if they are riding with the motorized vehicles right they can be any type of this so if there are if the number of lanes or an arterial is anywhere between 6 to 8 lanes divided and maximum width of the car lane is 3 to 3.3 meter it is always recommended that there be a segregated cycle track so if you are an arterial with a maximum of 6 to 8 lanes divided and each of the car lane widths are 3 to 3.3 meters at such situations it is always recommended that you have a segregated cycle track usually means that the average speeds of the vehicles are very high so the cyclists have feel unsafe riding with the uh, traffic or with the vehicular traffic and hence they need a segregated cycle track similar is the case uh, similar is the case for sub arterials when uh, you have about 4 to 6 lanes divided and uh, a car lane of 3 to 3.3 meter you have to have a segregated cycle track but you see as you start getting uh, uh, more local and local uh, uh, from a point of view of a distributor or a collector street and a local or an access street where there are only two lanes or maybe even one lane of, of width of uh, 2.75 to 3 meter they can ride with the mixed traffic or they can just have a 
cycle lane. This lane can be designed on the uh, carriageway itself and they need not have a segregated cycle track. So, as the hierarchy of the um, uh, roads decrease, hierarchy decreasing meaning average speed of vehicles on the roads decrease, your need for a segregated separate cycle track also reduces, right? Cyclists become more and more comfortable riding with the traffic, so they can ride with mixed traffic. Similarly, if you look at other design elements, other design elements such as gradient and the width of uh, lanes required. If you are on an arterial which has a gradient of uh, 1 is to 12 to 1 is to 20 and the lane width, desirable lane width of such, such a minimum of 2.2 meter uh, for two lane track and 3 to 4 meter for shared lanes of segregated cycle tracks need to be provided. So, you also have to remember how much wide cycle tracks you need when in case of different types of gradient that are available at different hierarchy of roads, right. So, when you are on a distributor, you just need a cycle lane, you can have a 1.2 meter painted, 1.2 meter painted cycle lane. When you are on an access road, you do not even need a lane because they are going to ride with the mixed traffic. So, I hope you have clearly understood how to design for different types of bicycle uh, facilities based on the different roadways on which these facilities are to be provided. That brings us to the end of this uh, lecture series. Uh, we have looked at uh, end of this lecture, we have one more lecture left in this series uh, for this week. Uh, in this lecture, we have taken references from the IRC uh, 11, uh, which was developed in 2015 and some of the cross sectional pictures have been taken from the planning and design guideline for cycle infrastructure developed by the Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation. You have been uh, 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 exposed to what are the different design principles uh, for uh, designing bicycle facilities. You have, uh, you have been uh, uh, exposed to how uh, the bends at uh, different cycling uh, tracks have to be provided what is the minimum uh, cycling speed that has to be maintained and also how different cycling infrastructure has to be designed for different hierarchy of roads. Thank you very much.